Hey everybody, welcome to the Player Stake episode 119. I am your host, Justin DeSimone, joined by my co-host. He's hoping AMC goes to the moon, Montreal Rice. How are you doing today, my friend? <laughs> hey, what's up? So, uh, you know, I don't know if you've been you've been watching them stonks, man, but uh, AMC had a nice day today. It's up to Actually, like I, yeah, I've been off the meme stocks lately. Uh, ever since that tank, like two weeks ago, a week and a half mm-hmm. ago, I've kind of been just waiting yeah. to see how everything handles out. So, yeah, I I really haven't been paying attention to them for a while. The only reason I even mildly pay attention anymore is because I own AMC stock. <laughs> I bought some in like January when the shit was like first popping off and I've held it, you know, I've held strong, but I don't know, man, 26, I'm, I made a little money today. You know, I'm kind of debating about selling, but we'll see. I don't know. I'm just going to watch tomorrow and see what happens. <clears throat> People are, you know, on uh, wall street bets though, are losing their fucking minds like they did originally. And they, they you know, they're like, Oh yeah, we're going to hit like 500 K shares. Like, dude, what the fuck are you talk? Jesus Christ. Like, 500k share nah but you know we'll see we'll see if it goes a little higher we'll see if or if it just craters tomorrow and i lose everything it's all right whatever well uh how are you doing otherwise Montreal? uh life is fucking hectic i can't get a week to chill out <laughs> i know i know what you mean dude i know what you mean i'm actually really looking forward to this weekend uh yeah, well not for me i have a family coming in so oh I'm that's right chilling yeah yeah we'll get into that in a second actually because yeah there's a game we're playing that you're not going to play with us this weekend because you, uh, uh, so you guys, are, coming in. You you guys in. are playing this weekend i, th- I could probably I mean, play i could probably play friday night i okay. know for sure i can play I, friday i don't night. know it's gonna be late friday night but i can play friday night we're gonna get into it in the games we're playing, because man, I'm uh, oh, this yeah. is throwing a wrench into everything. Okay, our friends just fucking <laughs> blew it all up. They're just like they. Okay. Well, you went out with them. That's right, you went out with them. <laughs> this motherfucker <laughs> goes out on what was it yesterday we're, or we're, two days ago? This is what we're, we're, we're talking about the games. We're okay, all right, all right. Okay, but, yeah, uh, we're getting sidetracked. Uh, we're getting sidetracked. Yeah, but yeah. like for my life or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. this is a slice of life part. Uh, so I'm, I'm currently trying to transition Silas over to my house now. Mm. Um, so I'm um, getting everything prepared for him. I'm also trying to, I ordered a washer and dryer. Um, so I'm waiting for that to come in. Like everything okay. is supposed to be coming in next this weekend. Ah. Um, but I actually called the delivery people and I had them postpone it until Wednesday because, or not Wednesday, but Tuesday, um, because I just don't want that. And then my brother coming in here and all this yeah. stuff. And I'm just like, yeah. Uh, and then one of my friends, she was like really sick, so I had to take care of her, or just see how she was doing and stuff like that. So it was just been like, it's yeah. just been like, uh, fucking crazy as shit uh, this week. So, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, um, I don't know if you guys are here six months ago, but like my job is like really cool now. Like we're in like a dead period right now, and there's like mm-hmm. nothing going on. So, uh, and everyone <laughs> in my job nice. loves me. Yeah, everyone in my job loves me now. So it's like uh that's a total three sixty or three sixty, a total one eighty from about three <laughs> three months ago where I was like on the edge of my seat. Mm-hmm. So, well Montreal my job yeah. on the other hand, I'm in the total opposite. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's I, just I you. <laughs> holy fuck. Like, dude, okay. So I got a promotion recently at my job, but I'm like transitioning, so I'm kind of between roles right now. I'm like working on both teams and I I I'm at the point where I can't even find an hour to take lunch. Like that's how busy my day is, and it's happening almost every day. It's like it's a severe struggle. Like today I came into the day like, oh, okay, I'm going to take lunch at one to two. And then somebody just like, bang, meeting one to two, you know, like, okay, well, fuck Justin, I guess, you know, it's like, that's like the one disadvantage of a nine to six shift is that everybody else is running on the 12 o'clock noon being your lunchtime, noon to one. So everybody always schedules meetings at one. And it's like, man, God, mother, God, (laughs) you know, so I don't know. (laughs) But hey, it's all good. Life's good, you know. It's just, it's just, uh, I'm tired. So, but I'm always tired. Yeah, I can, I can imagine, man. Mm-hmm. So, uh, okay. Well, let's get into it. This is, uh, you know, this isn't a slice of life anime podcast. You know, <laughs> even though we like those animes, uh, this is for those of you who haven't listened before our weekly show where we talk about video games, video game news, and other topics pertaining to video games. We post at six a.m. Central Time on Fridays on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, 
and your favorite podcast app of choice. Please also send us questions on Twitter to at the players take, or you can send us emails to the players take zero one at gmail.com. We have been reading those and answering them at the end of the end of the episode, uh, which we will be doing once again today. We've got another couple questions from that dude holding it down. Uh, but we want some questions from, from some of the rest of you fucking uh, freeloaders or whatever you want to call them, you know, <laughs> call scallywags. Freeloaders. Mm-hmm. freeloaders. I mean, it's not like we charge anything for this podcast anyways, but, you know, uh, you're still freeloaders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Montreal. So, you you know, I'm kind of chomping at the bit here. We got a lot to talk about this week. Uh, yes, there's a ton of news, a yeah. uh, lot of games to talk about. So let's just jump into it, man. Let's start with what we're playing. Uh, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, so I've been playing, I only play like 10 minutes of Near Replicant, but I am starting mm-hmm. that now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm currently on... I still haven't finished Mass Effect 1. I'm almost to the end. Um, oh but I also, I actually put that down uh, to play Resident Evil. Okay. But actually, you know what? I did finish Mass Effect 1. I'm sorry. I haven't mm-hmm. finished Mass Effect 2. So I'm currently playing Mass Effect 2. Um, I see. And I beat that game. Uh, you know, phenomenal game. Wait, Mass Effect 2, mm-hmm. you beat it? You, you're I saying mean, not you... 2, 1. 1, one. okay. Beat 1. Oh, okay. Yeah. Phenomenal game. <laughs> you're confusing um, me. Yeah. Uh beat uh resident evil 8 this weekend as well mm-hmm. uh love that i think uh i take everything i said back about the first person aspect of resident evil i don't know um what happening i mean they actually have a diary the, the development for this game was actually pretty hell um mm-hmm. but this game came out really fucking good uh this game is probably my second favorite resident evil game next to 4 wow and Cypress. yeah and it's almost it almost I have to play it one more time. I played it two times already. I had to play it like one more time just to see yeah. like if uh if it's up there uh, if it's surpassed for. Because the story's good. Uh if, if you're like a huge Resident Evil fan or you mm-hmm. know somewhat about the story, uh the lore dump they give you at the end where you discover notes and stuff like that is just like uh it's it's really good writing. They brought it back around and connected everything. Mm-hmm. Um the main character is actually good in this i mean it's still the same it's still ethan who was in resident evil 7 but uh you can tell like his growth from resident evil 7 to resident evil 8 and how he Mm -hmm. handles situations and stuff like that uh the bosses uh or the enemies they all have their unique personalities and i actually they put a lot of depth into these uh to these uh villains i actually like them uh i'll be honest lady uh dimitri Diamond Lady Trescue, D, that's how I yeah. say it. I don't know. Yeah, I think just say like, Lady D. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, Lady D is actually the weakest villain as far as characters in this game. Uh, the one that really impressed me was Heisenberg, and another one that uh they really didn't show in the trailers was uh, uh Benevito. Uh, mm-hmm. she controls like dials and stuff like that. Uh, her section was like her section of, her, of the game was actually really interesting. Uh, it reminded me of like Clock Tower and PT because you couldn't use your weapons. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Uh, the game is only like ten hours long, but it is a, a good ten hours. Like it's replay replayability is really good. Um, and then I'm not going to mention the last one until you, you get done with yours. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I mean, I've just been playing Neo Two, uh, Final Fantasy Tactics, Apex Legends. You know, not, nothing new to say with those. Um, Mass Effect though, uh, Montreal, Mass Effect Two. So I'm on Mass Effect Two. Uh, I've been playing it since last week. Um. And, uh, dude, uh, I fucked up my save. <laughs> what? How do did you, you do that? Do you remember? So I didn't remember this because I haven't played Mass Effect 2 in like 10 years. Um, well, like all the way through, I haven't played it in like 10 years. Uh, s- do you remember the mission where you go to like a derelict ship and you need to get something from it? Um, and you you meet like a, a, a geth that, you know is is more friendly than normal geth do you remember that mission uh, fuck it we're just gonna go spoilers spoilers if you don't want to hear spoilers i need to explain it, this fully is it legion like you mean yes legion? when the mission where you get legion yeah yeah i guess yeah, that's a good yeah. way to that's a good way to say it um yeah the mission you get legion i forgot that when you start that mission and complete it 
uh, the game goes into its end game phase where there's something that happens after that mission, like a couple oh, missions after that mission. Yeah, yes, you're right. You remember that? And then uh, yeah. there's some urgency to like complete the game after that. Uh, the next event happens. Uh, yeah. So I did that and that event happened yesterday or actually, yeah, it was yesterday. It happened to Wait, me. I thought they give you, they sit you around the round table and they say, before you do anything else, do you guys have anything you want to close out? Like yes, they, give you that they do say that. No, they say that. So the thing is, this is the fucked up part. So the game, okay, we are going to go into spoilers here. I'm, I'm sorry. I can't explain this fully without like without talking about specifics. So if you don't want to hear this, skip ahead a little bit. <clears throat> um, You know, the crew gets abducted on that part, right? Yeah. And you have a time limit to save them. So if you do what the game says and you're like, you know you take it at face value and the game's like oh if you have other things you want to finish go ahead and finish them if you do that you only get like one or two missions of leeway not even i I think you get like one mission of leeway and if you do like a a few missions all the crew dies basically um in the final mission if you if you do that so that's the thing i fucked up i have a ton of shit still to do in this game like i have a ton of loyalty missions i haven't done side missions i haven't done i barely explored like any of the galaxy map for uh, to be honest with you so i'm i'm like i would dude i was panicking last night because i looked through my saves and i don't have a save the last save i have from before i did that that uh mission to with legion um was 15 hours ago in 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 game in game time and i'm like Dude, it was so so. It was before I did Ilium. It was it was like I hadn't even gotten the whole crew yet. Like I, dude, it was so. I, I they do that. I thought so they, much uh, progress progress that I would lose if I went back. So you get started, Legion, yeah, and then because I'm trying to remember. So you get Legion, and then I thought I know you had a fight with Tali with Tali and Legion, and you had to resolve that fight. That's after whatever. you do both of their loyalty missions that that happens. But the thing is, you get Legion, and you need to do his loyalty mission, like, immediately. Because if you don't, like, this is assuming that you did everything else before you got Legion. Um, that's So this is the funny part, Montreal, is that I've played this game before, and I fucking beat it, right? You would think this version of me, who knows Mass Effect 2 and has played Mass Effect 2, would have remembered this information. But I didn't remember any of this, to be honest. I remembered... Most of the story missions, except for the one where you get Legion, I had like no fucking memory of it at all. And to be honest, that mission sucks. Complete dick, by the way. I fucking hated it. But um, no, I didn't remember this. So I fucked my save file up. The per- the me who played this game originally, like 10 or 12 years ago or 11 years ago, whatever it was, uh, I had a perfect save file in that game. I saved everyone. All my my entire crew lived. I saved the Normandy crew after they got abducted. I didn't lose anybody and I completed the entire game. And like, I did this blind, by the way, without knowing any of these mechanics. Like, I just happened to stumble into a perfect save file originally. And it's just, it's, it pissed me off so much yesterday. So the reason I was really upset, though, is because there's one trophy that's tied to, because I'm going for the platinum in all three of these games right now. And this. Yeah. There's one trophy where you need to save, you need the entire team you take to the suicide mission to live through the suicide mission. Um, and I, I, dude, I spent an hour researching last night if the crew of the Normandy counts towards that trophy. And I found out that they do not. I'm hoping that that's the, the problem is I couldn't find out definitively for the legendary edition if that's the case, because they change trophies in this game. Like the achievements are different. Uh, some of them, um, they have different requirements, and some were just taken out entirely and new ones were put in. But um, supposedly, if 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 they because this one did they didn't change the wording of it at all, so I'm hoping it's the same trophy. And if it is, this is the only trophy that would be blocked by this that would like I would miss out on, which means I'd have one trophy missing for the entire fucking franchise, and I would be so pissed off if that happened. So, so yeah, I don't care about losing the crew. I really actually don't. I read about the consequences and they're minor. It's just a little bit of dialogue in the next game uh, for some of them. And then I think one of them you can add to your crew and there's some dialogue with them. Uh, It's not super important to me. I'm actually okay with it because it's like, you know what? Fuck it. This game's about consequences. Like, let's just embrace the fact that I fucked this up, you know, like, 
Um, yeah. So, so I'm actually okay with that. It's really the trophy that's like killing me. You know, I, I have a degenerate disease with the trophies. Apparently I, I really can't like get past that, but I mean, come on anybody that is like, likes things neat. Wouldn't it piss you off to have like a 99% on Mass Effect 2 and you don't have the fucking platinum, you know? Because of one trophy, because of this shit, this stupid mechanic, you know? <sighs> I didn't so. even know that. I, I, cause I, the way that I play Mass Effect 2 and 1 is I, I, try, I try to do all the side missions before like a next mm-hmm. like major right. mission. Just exactly you know? what I did back in the day. That's the reason this worked out well for me. But now, this time, I'm replaying these games, so I'm being a little bit more impatient with things. Mm. You know, and I'm trying to get the main game's quests to a certain point and then clear all the side content. You know, that's kind of how I'm approaching it. And uh, that was not the correct thing to do in Mass Effect 2. So, yeah. So fair warning for those of you who are listening uh, and uh, haven't played Mass Effect before or forgot this information. Yes, the the mission. I don't know how to say it. I don't know. I, I'm just going to say the name of the mission. The mission where you have to go get the Reaper IFF. Don't do that mission until you've done everything else or everything you want to do with the game, like loyalty missions, side quests, exploring the galaxy. Until you're satisfied with all that, do not do the Reaper IFF mission because that starts a clock that um, you cannot stop. You cannot go back. You cannot do anything unless you have a save file. So fair warning on that. So that sucked, but I'm really enjoying the game. Otherwise, it's very fun. I like the characters. I, you know, I will say the main quest sucks. It's it's as boring as I remember it being. The collectors are such a lame fucking villain. Like, there's some interesting things about it that the game reveals. You know, like the the I don't know if you remember this, but they're like the Protheans. Like they got like modified, and they're basically Protheans. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I remember yeah, you remember that. that? Yeah. So like that was kind of cool and. There's one more reveal that I I remember coming in the suicide mission too that I I'm pretty sure I rem- remember, um, but you know but the the thing is this game shines in its side content that's where this game is just so fucking excellent like almost unbeatable with with that like the the side missions in this game are just so fucking good man, um and the uh, the DLC like I did uh, Kasumi's mission loyalty mission. And that's the one where you go to that like ritzy party and you're trying to break into this dude's vault or whatever. Shit's fucking super cool, man. Um, and he has like the Statue of Liberty head in the fucking vault and all these like artifacts from human from human history. Um, it's really cool shit. I will say about the DLC though, uh, this is another warning. Uh, some of the DLC is not. Um, there's one in particular that you get from uh, one of the DLCs involving Liara. Uh, there's a dialogue option in the game because you have all the DLC installed automatically that will immediately start that mission if you click on it. So just be aware of that. Save before you talk to Liara because the thing is, you don't want to do that mission until either right before you do the suicide mission or after you finish the game because it just doesn't fit canonically with the rest of the game because there are missions, if you do that mission early, you will eliminate some missions that Liara gives you um, in in the actual main plot of Mass Effect Two, and they they oh, like literally won't that. be given to you. Um, oh, yeah, okay. because she's trying to get information on the Shadow Broker, and the DLC is the layer of the Shadow Broker. So, like, if you go to the layer of the Shadow Broker, she doesn't need the information anymore. <laughs> you know, so it's like you know it kills those side qu- or it kills some of those side quests. So be aware of that. And there's a second one called Rival that we talked about. They give you that one really early in the game and uh, don't do it because it makes no sense if you do it in the middle of Mass Effect 2's plot. Like, you need to do it after you finish the game. That's what the DLC is intended for. It's supposed to be a lead-in, direct lead-in to Mass Effect 3. Like, literally. Like, takes place right before Mass Effect 3 begins. So, um, so yeah. A little bit awkward with the DLC. It's kind of annoying that they didn't fix some of that stuff um, with the Legendary Edition. Because that that existed in the original game too. It's just you know they didn't they didn't really change any of that. So um, kind of weird they didn't do anything with that because there's no indicator, especially with Liara's, that this mi- that this starts a mission. This dialogue option it literally just says a line the way anything in the dialogue wheel does, and you know. But if you click on it, bang, you're in the mission. You know, so be wary of that too. Okay, enough of Mass Effect. Unless you have anything else you want to say, Montreal, about Mass Effect. Uh, nah, because I don't 
I think we I think we kill it Mass Effect Love next week last week. <laughs> okay. Well, we, we're going to keep killing it. I mean, we're still playing it, man. Um, but yes. So there's a game called Final Fantasy 14. We've talked about it on the show before, you know. We know people who play it too, both of us. Um, but we've kind of been getting frustrated. Our friend group's kind of been getting frustrated with Apex a little bit. I think I mentioned this last week. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we've been kind of talking about different games we could play, like Burning Crusade Classic, Fantasy Star Online 2, New Genesis, uh, Final Fantasy 14, you know, we're done with Monster Hunter, so that one's off the table. Uh, and this motherfucker, Montreal, goes out with our friends on a Tuesday, right? Was it Tuesday? Yep, it was Tuesday. Uh, and they have this discussion, I guess, about what they're going to play, and he convinces everybody that we're going to play Final Fantasy 14, I guess. Okay, so I didn't convince nobody. Okay. Jet was already, I would say, 80% there. You think and so? Then, yeah, okay. no, Jet was like really 80% there because he was like, mm-hmm. what do we all want to play or whatever? And I'm like, well, you know, me and Justin were thinking about doing Final Fantasy 14. And then he was like, yeah, I think I want to do that too. Because Andy was like, hey, mm-hmm. let's play WoW. And... Justin, um, not Justin Jet was like, I don't even want to touch WoW right now. Like, I don't mm-hmm. want to do anything. To, I don't want to do anything with WoW um, mm-hmm. at all. So Jet was already there. Like, even he classic, like, he doesn't want to do anything with. He doesn't want to do any. He he said he didn't want to touch WoW at all. Like, okay. I was saying, I was like, hey, I'm willing to do Burning Crusade. Like, I'm I'm willing yeah. to do that. And he, Jet was like, nah, I don't want. I really don't want to touch WoW anytime soon. So he's like completely turned off a of while, WoW huh. uh, which is hilarious. Yeah, it's it's funny because like even Andy was, Andy was convincing me about Shadowlands. I'm like, hmm, maybe I should give Shadowlands. No, a dude, chance. don't. I fell for his sales pitch. Shadowlands sucks. It's not <laughs> it's not cool. <laughs> Fuck that shit, dude. No. So yeah, he he was telling me about that. Um, and then at the end, we all just decided that we we're gonna do Final Fantasy 14. Um. Just because it's more convenient for everyone's lives right now, like the True. way the game is structured and set up, yeah. And um, yeah, even if I come in late, it will level you guys down to where I can, you guys can still get XP, and I can get XP and level me up and stuff like that. So I, I think I think it's a really good game, and uh, we can probably get Dennison from the Catch Up Podcast. Listen to this mm-hmm. podcast, guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. We can uh, get Dennison to play because I think. It will be a much easier MMO for him to wrap his head around, and he can play on his PS5. So, yeah, remember when we got him to play Classic? Yeah, he... <laughs> and he couldn't even get logged in. By the time yeah. he got logged in, and he went to bed, like that's what was happening to him. And I think he was like level six with yeah. uh, WoW Classic by the time by the time we all quit. And he, you know, he just, he literally never got out of the starter zones. That like, it was probably the worst MMO launch I've ever seen. Like, I've never seen an MMO launch it, like that. It, okay. Uh, to be fair, I don't think it's the worst. I've seen much worse than that. Like, Age of Conan was a fucking disaster. Um, Ion was pretty bad. Uh, even, even Original WoW was pretty bad. But the problem was, is the Q situation... <sighs> Yeah, just for our where our lives are, like we were having to do degenerate shit to be able to play the game, you know, like because by the time if I didn't if I didn't log into the game, you know, before I left my job somehow, you know, like remoted into my home PC and launched the game, I wouldn't be able to play till like eleven o'clock. It was fucking night. It was just a nightmare. It was it was terrible. Yeah, so. I just I mean I, I know we talked about it before, but I just. In my opinion, the reason I say it was the worst within the last 10 to 15 years is because we are so far advanced from when Classic WoW, like Mm -hmm. WoW first launched, when Ion first launched, Age of Conan first launched. Like, there should have been servers. Like, Blizzard is way bigger than it was now, and there should have been servers to accommodate these millions of people that were trying to log into the game. Mm -hmm. So that's that's just my take on it. But uh, we won't have that issue with Final Fantasy XIV. Um... We just need to choose a server that everyone needs wants to go to. And we already we chose log the server. In. Oh, we did. Oh, I didn't see that. It's like I mean, I'm not going to say are, it right now, but you know, you guys were like texting so much. It was a hundred messages by the time I looked at my phone one time. <laughs> I was like, "What the <laughs> fuck is you going on?" To in this me, group sometimes, chat? man, where I'm not paying attention, and all of a sudden there's like eighty thousand messages, <laughs> and I'm like, "What the fuck are they even talking about?" My anymore? bubble like, literally said a hundred. I'm like, "Bro, yeah. what are they talking about?" Yeah. yeah. Um. So I'm probably going to do. 
uh, the standard party is going to be, I guess, like a healer slash two DPS. That's a standard light party. Yeah, and then and a then, tank, uh, right? Yeah, then a tank. And I think a medium party is a like three or four DPS and then a healer and two healers and then yeah. one tank. Okay. Um, so I was thinking about doing like a ninja. I still want to play ninja, even though I played ninja a couple, like two years ago. Yeah. I still want to play ninja. Ninja is super fun. Yeah. Um, and I'll probably have my secondary as a tank. I don't know if I'm going to do like a, the regular pally. I do have a level 57 pally already. Um, mm -hmm. Or I can just, I actually want to try one of the other tank classes. I think it's like Samurai. I know Andy said he's going to do that. So there's I think Dark Knight, Dark Knight, Gunbreaker, and I don't think Samurai is a tank. Oh, it's not? I thought Samurai I, was I don't a think tank. so. I don't think so. Okay. Um, yeah, I forget there's a fourth one, good, though. though. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, dude, I, I, like the thing is, the thing about it, though, is like this just like happened yesterday. Like literally during the day, everyone's like, OK, so we're getting on tonight. We're figuring it was like, what the guys like what the like all like what like Tuesday happens. And all of a sudden we're all just buying Final Fantasy 14. Like I was like, what the fuck? Like fortunately, <laughs> it was on sale on uh, PSN for 24 bucks. So I, I wasn't like. I'm not, I wasn't paying full price for it basically is what I meant to say. So we got, we got lucky in that regard. Um, cause it was on sale. It was also on sale at square Enix's store for PC. So people could get it there too. Um, but yeah, I was like, I was like, dude, I'm like, I'm in the middle of mass effect right now. I'm playing Neo two still. I got Final Fantasy tactics. We're still playing apex. Like, like, I, like, fuck. Like <laughs> if I was there, I probably would have talked you all down. You know, I like, I really probably would have, because I'm like, I can't, I'm not going to commit to this like every fucking night, you know, like I'm not like Jet, Jet's already talking about poop sock in this shit this weekend is the what the term he uses. I think it should uh, be a weekend game for us because I like yeah, not, playing video games yeah. on the weekend. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, because I'm, I'm like, dude, during the week, man, oh God, that's just, it's just not the best time for me to play a game like this, you know, Um, so I don't know. I'm going to play with you guys. We'll just see. We'll see how far it goes. I don't know. I, I, I don't necessarily have faith in us. However, I did get one of my friends uh, who um, is in my dynasty league. Actually, uh, he's he wanted to play Final Fantasy 14 with me like a few couple of years ago, and we never did it. So I've roped him in and he's going to be making a character, actually. So we've got another one there. Uh, my brother is interested, but he's not. He doesn't have time right now or the money to really to jump into this right now. Uh, but he may jump in in the future too. That is the nice part about Final Fantasy 14 is that we're not really going to, no one's going to be like left behind per se because of the scaling, the way the, the game does scaling. So yeah. um, I like that aspect to it. And also the fact that you can just change jobs. Like I could just go level a new job with somebody else like that comes in fresh, you know? Um, yeah, exactly. So yeah. so yeah, I mean, the game's, uh, the game's convenient in that way. And also it's kind of bite sized that you could play it for an hour. You know, once you, once you get in the swing of it, you can kind of play it for an hour or maybe an hour and a half and actually get a dungeon done, you know, a dungeon or two done, maybe some quests. So it's uh it's definitely a, a good game for our lifestyle right now, I think, but it's just like the way it happened was just like, you guys hang out, you know, and he invited me too, but I, you know, it was like, it was a Tuesday night. He invited me at like five. I was like, nah, nah I'm good. <laughs> Like, I'm good, man. I, uh, you know, this is a little short notice for me. But, uh, but yeah, like, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm sure they're having fun. And then all of a sudden, you, they everybody comes back and they're talking about Final Fantasy XIV the next day. I'm like, oh, shit. Matra, what did you do? So, you know. I didn't do anything. They actually mm -hmm. brought the conversation. I don't even know how the conversation popped up. I was just like, yeah, I said me and you were thinking about doing Final Fantasy XIV. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I said maybe around... Uh, later on this year we're gonna jump into it but yeah. i didn't say like everybody jump into it right now like i was like hey i would rather jump into it like at the end of june or something because yeah i still gotta finish games myself so yeah um but yeah i mean it's still a convenient game i think it can be i'm gonna ask everyone can we just play it on the weekends mm -hmm. like that would be more convenient for all of us like it can be our sunday game because i know a lot of this happen you don't think so? Like we could just do no. it on Sundays, dude. You know how Jet is, dude. Like he, 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 he doesn't play single player games the way we do. He is a multiplayer gamer, so he's gonna play that game every night, pretty probably that we are playing Apex. Like that's what he's gonna do. So yeah, we're gonna yeah. get left behind, Montreal. That's just it's just the reality of the situation.
Well, only good thing about it is snakes can't really play right now because both both of them get into the same thing. It's gonna be over mm-hmm. for us. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, he can't play because he doesn't have a PC and Xbox. There's no Xbox port for uh, Final Fantasy fourteen. So Which fucking sucks. I feel bad for Xbox people. They can't play. Yeah, game. it does suck. Cause yeah, Square people ask Square about it every few months, and they're like, eh, it hasn't been a priority for the team. <laughs> they're like, we don't really care. Yeah, I mean they so, already make it. So you're playing it on PS4 or PS5? You're gonna play it? On oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I've, I played it on PS4 a couple of years ago, dude. It plays really well. Um, well, I know, I know that. I was just, I don't know. I'm thinking I'm gonna do it on PC. Think I'm um, it. the thing is, if I like, I don't. The, the game does have cross progression between both platforms, which is nice. So, um. I can switch to PC if I ever feel the need to, you know, I'll just have to buy the game again, but I'll just wait till it's on sale and do that, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's not that, it's not really that big of a deal to me to, to, to play like if, cause yeah, I played final fantasy 14 very casually and I, and I want to play it like that where I can kind of lean back and just use a controller. Cause I actually bought like a little, uh, I have it here, even though we're not on video or anything. I, I bought a little, uh, like a keypad a couple of years ago when we were playing it the last time. Um, that is like a keyboard. It's literally a keyboard. So I can use the auction house and stuff, um, you know, without having to use like the PlayStation's like fucking <laughs> keyboard or whatever in the, in the, in the game interface. So, um, so yeah, I, you know, I have this thought out, you know, don't worry. I'm not going to suck. I'll be, yeah, I'll you be know good. I think I might do Samurai. I think I might do Samurai uh, Gunslinger. <laughs> this motherfucker isn't even listening to me. I am, uh, I am listening to you. I just uh, uh, Gunbreaker. Yeah. Oh shit! I might do the other one too. Machinist. That shit looks mm-hmm. fucking dope. Well, all right, all right. okay. Anyway, let's go. Yeah. Anyways, Matt, Final Fantasy fourteen. We will be playing it. We'll probably talk about it in the coming weeks. As we I am going to play, play as a cat girl, bitches. Oh, I'm already wow. a cat girl, and my cat girl is super cute. So, wait, know. do we have the bunny people in here too? They, oh, they do. The I people. think they added ah. that. Yeah, I played the bunny um, girl. Yeah, that is one thing about Final Fantasy 14 that's really awesome. I just think the aesthetic of the characters is fucking excellent. You know, yeah, like, all, yeah. All the races just look so good to me. You know, so, so yeah, so yeah. We'll have more to say as we play. Uh, but Montreal, we've been going for 30 minutes already. We need to get into the news because there is a fuck ton. Of news to talk about. So All right, let's, let's start. It. Let's start with EA. EA. They uh they have opened a new studio. Um gameindustry.biz. This is from gameindustry.biz. Um they've opened a new studio. I don't believe it has a name yet, but they have hired the ex uh director of or actually the ex head of Monolith Productions, which was the studio that made the Shadow of War and Shadow of Mordor games for wb um and they are this this studio will be tasked by ea EA to make a single player open world action adventure game so this is a new this is new territory for ea because they've been kind of not in this realm ever not ever but yeah they really haven't done anything in this realm in recent years and uh, this has always been ubisoft's realm more than anything and even a little bit more activision and other publishers as well well, I think it's so, a perfect time because mm-hmm. Ubisoft is making that weird move. They're trying to make their games like free to play, but also, <laughs> right. you know, pay mm-hmm. pay to win. So I think this is actually a good time to move in on their territory because Ubisoft hasn't really been doing too hot within their within their own open world IPs, if that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I think it's nice to see EA doing stuff like this, you know, because I mean, we talk about them in a very negative light sometimes and. They're not a very well liked publisher in the industry, especially amongst the gamers themselves. But um, to be honest, though, I don't think they're a bad publisher most of the time. You know, they they do make good games sometimes. Like it's not impossible for them to make a good game. So we'll see. Uh, I guess we'll see what comes out of this. I mean, are you expecting it though to be like littered with microtransactions the way Ubisoft does with Assassin's Creed or? Uh, I mean, this is the guy who made Shadow of War, so <laughs> the, so I'm not putting so it past true. him. That's so true. That's a very good point. That is a very good point, dude. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, we'll see. Uh, this is a this is a good announcement, though. You know, EA is always famous for closing studios. It's nice to see them actually open one. Um, and they're doing something good with it. It's not just some new fucking live service game or some bullshit multiplayer goddamn game or something. You know, it's actually like a single player game 
coming from the publisher that said single player was dead, you know, several years ago. So it's funny how things turn. All right. Montreal. Move on to our next story. So a few months ago, we talked about how AT&T uh, was tr- looking to sell their video game division, uh, the WB Games Studios. While so something happened last week with AT&T, and uh, you, you may actually have some more insight into this, uh, but they have broken off Warner Media and then most of their media division, like their, their content creation division, in a merger with the company with a company named discovery and discovery is going to be running the company that they're merging with, but at and still T still going to have a, an ownership stake in this, you know, new company they're forming. But uh, basically at and is planning to, they want to, they want to break this off because they want to focus on actually like providing their service to people and get mm-hmm. out of the content creation game. Yeah. Which is why, uh, you know, I, I kind of mentioned you because I you you used to you worked for them in a previous life. Uh, yeah, how, is this funny to you to see this? Uh, yeah, there must have been something really big for them to kind of change their motto. Um, mm-hmm. uh, because I, maybe the pandemic changed their whole thing. Because, like I said, when I was working there uh, mm-hmm. five years ago, four or five five or six years ago, rather. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Their whole thing was like, yo, when 2020 comes, like we're switching everything. Like they kept saying like when 2020, 2020 is a vision, 2020 is the future, 2020, 2020, 2020. And their thing was, yeah, they're trying to get into more entertainment and things of that nature. Uh, you know, you versus going to be the future. And uh, I think at the time, the gigabyte speed was an experimental thing that was only in Dallas and mm-hmm. San Francisco. Um, and we were also competing with, or we, they were also competing with Google Fiber, which was new at the time and sucking yeah. up markets at the time as well. Um, so they were actually, they thought Google Fiber, I think, was going to take over everything. And they were actually trying to transition more towards entertainment, which is mm-hmm. interesting now that Google Fiber is ceased to exist anywhere. Gone. Um, yeah. Um, and Tom Warner is the only one that's, you know, really out here in Texas or Spectrum rather. Mm-hmm. Um, charter and you have i think that's it maybe some smaller other well, companies. i mean charter charter and warner are together so they they form yeah. spectrum so it's, re- yeah, it's literally form... spectrum and frontier frontier that's, that's the other one i was thinking about yeah yeah and then maybe some smaller ones here and there um but besides that um this is really interesting because uh i was harping on them maybe a couple episodes maybe like a two two or three months ago how they need to get out into the rural areas and expanded infrastructure how much money they're missing out on they may have to put in money before they you know um get money back but it will be worth it because you have people moving out uh to the suburbs which Mm -hmm. i mean i'm not trying to be like i know this is not like a uh that kind of podcast but statistically speaking a lot more people are buying houses in the suburb or in the rural areas now and building houses instead of buying houses in the suburbs and in the uh urban areas as well so i think that's a good move um i see a lot more housing developments and everything of that nature so that this actually makes sense but uh it's kind of funny coming from where they were coming from six years ago where they were like right. you know entertainment 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 mm-hmm. universe is the future and everything of that nature well clearly they acknowledge that it's not it didn't work their their little plan didn't work like because that they're i don't know their properties are like they have great ip available to them through warner um but they just not doing a whole lot with it and they're not doing a great job with it so uh, i think this is good for warner too um as well like i mean that th- this will help with their television and movie properties that they they want to make especially with the comic book stuff hopefully um but the thing is right now is that this deal is not finalized there's there's going to be several months before it is um, so we don't actually know yet which of the studios warner is going to be breaking off because um someone uh was actually able to speak to um AT&T an AT&T spokesperson and they said that not all of the game studios are going to be moving over in this deal. So AT&T will be keeping some of them and it's it's not clear which ones we're going to have. So these are the 11 they have. They have Rocksteady uh, who made the Arkham games, NetherRealm who makes uh, Mortal Kombat and all the fighting games we actually talked about them last week, Monolith who made the Shadow of War, Shadow of Mordor games, TT Games, which are the Lego Lego Studios games, 
Avalanche Software, which is making the uh, Harry Potter RPG, and they've made many other games in the past, open world games and whatnot. And then uh, WB Games Montreal, who made Arkham Origins, and I believe is making Gotham Knights. Um, and then the rest of these, I don't know their their history, but uh, WB Games Boston, Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, and New York. Those are the 11 studios. So we don't know which of those are going to be moving over uh, to Discovery. It's kind of weird because, um, you know, Rocksteady in particular, and NetherRealm to to a degree, um, they work on Warner Brothers Media. Like they they use IPs from Warner in order to make their games. You know, with Batman and um, you know, uh, really the Batman with NetherRealm as well. So, and then Harry Potter actually with Avalanche too. So. That part of it kind of uh, is interesting to me. It makes me wonder kind of where these studios are going to end up or if they're going to sell some of them off potentially um, that they don't want to keep entirely. So we'll, we'll see how that is. If we find out, we'll obviously report it. Um, but TT Games is the other one because if they move them over to Discovery, their relationship with Lego doesn't necessarily just carry over automatically. They'll have to rewrite contracts and everything like that. So yeah. that is another one to kind of keep an eye on too, uh, for them. So, so yeah, it's an interesting deal. Uh, it's, I think it makes sense for AT&T. They're, they're, they're kind of one of the, in my opinion, they're, they are like the worst ISP out there. Um, and service yeah, provider for, for mobile as well. So yeah, they suck too much money out of, uh, like they, and they limit their stuff as well. So I think this is why they're, infra- um, they're actually expanding their infrastructure because they have that gigabyte limit on their, on some mm-hmm. of their stuff like you can only download i don't know one terabyte worth of stuff a month and then they start charging you per gigabyte or something like that something crazy fucking nuts um whereas with charter and the spectrum um i remember when they were starting to do that and people like uh from what my friend told me at spectrum he used to work for them and the lines were blowing up where people just like yo I'm leaving. If you don't get rid of this shit, I'm going to Frontier. They're right down the street from me. Like mm-hmm. it, it was, it was crazy. Um, so I think Spectrum's actually not going to go through with that. But um, AT and T needs to do something about that. But um, mm-hmm. it looks like I'm, I'm actually glad to see them kind of separate everything. Uh, maybe uh, they have more. They can. This can be a more focus on like putting those department heads in front of the game division. They have mm-hmm. more mm-hmm. leeway and stuff to do, whereas like when everything's one entity, it still has to go up the chain. If that makes any sense, so yeah, yeah, cool. Well, we'll monitor if uh, we get more more details. We will share them uh, on the show. All right, let's move on to our next story. This one, Montreal. Oh my god, sign me the fuck up, baby. So uh, this is from Fanbyte. They uh, have corroborated rumors that of of leaks uh for e for square enix's e3 presentation coming in the next couple weeks that they will be announcing a action rpg final fantasy game made by team ninja in the neo style and uh montreal i mean <laughs> called I'm, final fantasy origins call yes it's called final fantasy origins and it's going to be about the first Final Fantasy game, uh, it's going to take place in that time period. Ooh, and uh, Maybe, yes. Montreal, dude. I mean, if you... I was talking to my oh. brother about this the other day. What if we like, get like a remake out of this? Like, what if this sells so well, they remake Final Fantasy 1? That would be interesting. Yeah. yeah. That'd be kind of okay. cool. Um, but yeah, I was talking to my brother the other day about this. And I was like, I was like, dude, if you, if you asked me, like, if somebody wrote into the show and asked me what... IP would you like to see in the Neo style more than any other? I think Final Fantasy would probably be it. <laughs> like, holy fuck, dude. Like, it is a perfect fit, you know? Because um we're talking about playing Neo 2. We're still playing it, and it's funny to us because we're like, we're like, dude, if this Final Fantasy game was out, we drop Neo 2 like a ton of bricks. Like playing, like grinding for like Final Fantasy armor and weapons and shit it would just be so just nostalgia filled automatically, you know, like onion armor and the fucking like uh Ultima weapon and shit like that, you know, like, Oh God. Oh, it just sounds so, so I don't know. Obviously I don't want to get too excited. We haven't seen anything yet. This isn't even confirmed necessarily, but um, I will say if this is what it sounds like, 
I'm very, very excited. I mean, what about you, man? Does this like uh, pique your interest? Uh, I'm not like super excited, but yeah, it definitely piques my interest. Like, uh, I'm interested in seeing what's gonna what's gonna be. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I just think it's interesting that Square Enix is actually leaving a lot of their team. So it looks like they had the team that that made the City of NT. Um, mm-hmm. They're actually shifting them around for the Ninjas Team Ninjas uh, team. Which is something they did the opposite of with Final Fantasy VII remake. Remember, it was a uh, Cyber Connect Cyber making Connect, that game, right. and then they yeah. st- shot shot them down and was like, "Our internal team's going to work on it now." Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is really interesting. Uh, it looks like Square Enix, um, just like as a broad statement for Square, it looks like they're really involved in their games as far as like mm-hmm. trying to make them the best that they can be. I I, I think I really think they don't want another. And it's, this is funny because their fans, um, I mean, obviously me and you are fans too, but I, their fans have a, a veil over their faces. Like, whereas like, they're like, oh, Square Enix, you can do no wrong. You're a God. No more, you're a God. I love you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, whereas like, they're actually looking at like, no, Final Fantasy 15 was a disaster. We should have handled that better. Uh, mm-hmm. I think this is like internal talks for from what I'm thinking. I think they think Final Fantasy 15 was a disaster, and uh, Final or Kingdom Hearts the way they handled that it was a disaster as well. Mm-hmm. Um, um, as far as like, because when you think of Square Enix, you think of quality, and those games to me were like really not Square's quality as far as games um, games yeah. go. So I think uh, it's just really interesting how that they are shifting things around to make things better and things of that nature. So um, I have complete faith in this game that this game is going to be really good. I mean, Team Ninja knows what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Square Enix looks like they know what they're doing too at this point. Like they're super competent compared to like how they were like maybe three years ago, which is a huge turnaround. Yeah. Well, yeah. So the thing is the the Cyber Connect um, comparison is interesting because I think the difference here is like Square is picking a partner in Team Ninja that makes fucking high ass quality games, you know, like Neo and Neo 2 are some of the best games I've ever played, you know, in terms of their playability and just what they are in, in the games, systems and mechanics and everything and the style of it. It's just they're fucking beautiful games. Um, whereas Cyber Connect, I mean, no offense to them, but they're not they're not of that caliber, you know, which I think Square recognized at the time so and also you need to give them something that's appropriate right they're letting team ninja make a team ninja game with final fantasy like that's what they're doing which is perfect that's exactly what you do with a studio like this you know you don't you don't you don't go to team ninja and you're like you're like hey make us a turn-based rpg like what no like that wouldn't make any fucking sense so um it's good that square recognizes that and then also to your other point about them recognizing their own flaws is that dude i would say from about there's like a 10 year period from like 2006 to 2016 where i really think square enix as a publisher was severely lacking like they were not making good games that's true Uh, they they were making they were making mistakes all over the place like the original release of final fantasy 14 was a fucking absolute disaster and i think that game actually that particular game and what they did with that game is was really their turning point um because i think they realized that like oh fuck okay like we actually need to make quality games, you know, like if we make quality games, people will flock to our shit. It's not, we're not like EA, like we're not trying to nickel and dime people with shit, you know? Um, like I think that's square kind of settled into this period. Now, I think the last few years in particular, where I think they're really starting to pump out some really good, good stuff, you know, like they're making good games again and they seem really dedicated to that. So because, dude, I think a couple of years ago, right, we had like a State of Square Enix episode and uh, we were really negative in that episode. I think, <laughs> yeah, we were. Right? Yep. And I'd say since then, like, I've been in the complete opposite headspace with them for the most part. You know, like, I mean, yeah, like I'm actually looking forward to a lot of their projects now, whereas yes. before yep. it was like, oh, OK, what are we going to do here now? Like, oh, my goodness. Um, right. I think so. I mean, not to get off track, because I know we got a lot of stuff to do. So I just probably make this my last point. But um, <clears throat> I think uh, a lot of people or a lot of these uh, the Eastern companies, they were going through a weird transition phase. Um, mm. That mm-hmm. from that, uh, what would, would you say, 20, 2006 to 2000? The beginning of the PS3 generation, really. Yeah. 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 Like, so that, yeah. that's actually a good point. So the beginning of the PS3 generation, I think 
two main developers I can think of, Square mm-hmm. and Capcom, to yep. me have the, the biggest redemption arcs uh, right now. Because during that time, this is the peak of like when Call of Duty first came out. Mm-hmm. And I remember everyone and their mom was trying to get Call of Duty numbers. And I remember Square had this big agenda to push towards the West. And Capcom mm-hmm. had this big agenda to appeal towards the West. And in the long run, that actually hindered a lot of them. And they didn't stick to what they knew. They they were trying to cater towards... Mm-hmm. Um, what they thought know. we liked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, it just... There are some gems that came out of that. I mean, like, for um, for Capcom, we, we got fucking uh, Dragon's Dogma that came out of that because that was a straight mm-hmm. appeal to the West. Um mm-hmm. Trying to think for Final Fantasy or for obviously we got Final Fantasy 14 Reborn out of that because they had to remake it and things of that nature. Uh, they've realized I consider Last Remnant kind of a hidden gem of theirs during that period. Yeah, it but, it just it just came out, but it came it, out like mach- poop. It yeah, the machines like that came out on couldn't handle it in that in exactly. that instance. Um, so I think uh, that they just really need um, not they, but yeah, I, I think uh, Square Enix and Capcom really saw that. Gamers are wanting th- this JRPG push, and I don't know re- really what sparked it. To be honest with you, because I, I I can't even narrow down when everyone was like, "Yo, we need more JRPGs. We need more this and that and the third. Maybe Persona Five, but mm. that came out so late. That was like 2017 when that game came out, right? 2016, 2017. It might have, maybe Persona Four Golden, dude, on the Vita. Because you remember that game when that game came out on the Vita? That thing was like an absolute just force on a handheld that was already dead. <laughs> you know, um, it, it, I I remember that game being a phenomenon at the time, the, similar to Persona Five, actually, um, but. I don't know, like that game. I, I think, I think over the years, I think, I think they just they might have realized that they might have just listened to feedback too from people on forums and Twitter yeah. and whatnot, and just just seen people like, man, I really wish they would go back to you know, same with Capcom with Resident Evil. Like a lot of people were lamenting the direction they had taken that franchise with yep. five and six, and I think eventually Capcom maybe listened and was like oh shit you know maybe we need to just go back to the the, the survival horror roots of this and it, and it ended up working out you know and i think that's the other thing is what you said about tracing the call of duty numbers i think square and capcom in particular kind of accepted their place within the industry at a certain point yes where yeah, they're not yeah. <laughs> they're not at that level but that's okay like like fuck dude like you don't you don't have to strive for that constantly because if you do you're going to start making bad decisions you know i I just think every company during that time not to harp on capcom and uh and square enix they were the biggest offenders but a Mm -hmm. lot of companies were just trying to get call of duty numbers and because i think it was such a warcraft too was the other thing that was also under activision everybody was chasing activision it felt like yeah period of time uh like company wise yeah everyone was chasing it and we all saw the writing on the wall like i saw it i'm like i don't like the direction the game industry is going like the game industry i know is a business and their main goal is to make money but it just mm-hmm. seemed like before activision came a really big entity with call of duty everyone even the call of duty games themselves were made with like such passion and love um mm-hmm. i think that's why apex is doing really so well um because mm-hmm. that team vince uh zimpella he used to make he was the head and used to make uh call of duty games like you can tell the difference between when he left and how the call of duty games play uh to when he was there and how the call of duty games play and they were just made with such love and things of that nature um and a lot of other games like that in the west were and uh i don't know it just it just seemed really weird that game industry time that period of time where everything was trying to be online and it was just a weird time and we had the fucking used game pass that you had to buy and it was mm. it was just terrible so yeah oh my god yeah for online <laughs> yeah <laughs> what a bad time that was yeah there's periods you know i i do look fondly on the ps3 generation i do uh next Xbox 360 but i will say uh, admittedly there there's some rose colored glasses happening there I, I recognize that was not a great period for gaming um it it, 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 I think it's just the period where I became much more of a fan of the industry. So I look back on it really fondly. You know, that was the time I started really following studios and acquisitions and IP and stuff. Um, yeah, I can, know, I can so. definitely see that. It was just, 
for me though, I remember playing the same games over again. Like it was like Skyrim, mm-hmm. Fallout, Fallout New Vegas, and mm-hmm. it was a lot of Western games I was playing. I wasn't really playing too many JRPGs because they were almost non-existent at that time. Yeah, um, and if they were, really, they were bad. <laughs> yeah, you had to really go out your way to find a good one. Mm-hmm. Um. I, to me, like the game industry jumpstart happened at 2015 yeah. uh, when The Witcher 3 came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, that to me, not saying The Witcher 3 is the one responsible for the game industry jumping back, but that was like the start of like everyone was like, all right, we know what we need to do now. We have these somewhat powerful consoles and we can start doing something. It was just before then, for me personally, I was still into games, but from like 2010 to 2015, 2014, or 2013 rather, t- mid 2014, it was just like a dead period. Like it was mm-hmm. crazy to me how, if you look back on those years, you can't really think of really too many good games that came out during those years. I think I think there's a lot of games on PlayStation that I can call out. Probably like Last of Us One, Mass Effect Two and Three. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was a lot of Western games, like you were saying. I just think the 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 market for uh. The Eastern games at that point in time just were not that special, you know. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, you know, I, we got really off track here talking about like, <laughs> yeah, industry, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, like, uh, I, you know, this rumor for this game, I'm very excited. So I'm hoping we see it at E3. I hope it's real, and uh, hopefully get hopefully we get some gameplay, maybe and not just like a trailer, um, like a cinematic trailer, but we shall see. All right, Montreal, let's move on. We've got handheld rumors. All right. So uh, Ars Technica is reporting that Valve is making a Switch-like portable gaming PC. And uh, there's not much information in here other than that uh, it will uh, potentially be coming out this year uh, if if the supply chain uh, cooperates with Valve's plans. But uh, Montreal, what? How does this strike you? I mean, are you into this idea? A PC handheld, which we have plenty of these out there, actually, to be honest. But one from Valve specifically, though, that integrates with Steam. Uh, I don't play my PC that often. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I don't. I play my PC, but I don't use Steam often. Like, I, I the last time I was on Steam was when we all played fucking. Uh, PUBG. So, mm, mm-hmm. so uh, Jesus. Yeah, that, that's the last time I've been on Steam. Um, so, I mean, for me, it's not that big of a concern, but for others, I can see like them getting really super hype about it. To me, it's going to yeah. be the same thing. I don't even trust Steam. I don't trust Valve because they're mm. the the Steam box was such a fucking disaster. I know. Right. 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 Are they going to actually make this themselves? Like that, that, that's like my biggest question here. Or are they going to do what they did with the steam box and let everyone else make them? And it's just this weird, confusing mess. Um, Cause I don't know. I mean, I, I think the idea of this on paper isn't a bad one, but the problem is, is that PC games are inherently some of the most demanding out there because of what PCs can do compared to consoles. So, I just, there's just a lot of games I feel like that are going to end up getting excluded from being able to be played on this thing, you know? Yeah. Um, So I, I don't know. And also like we have the switch, you know, everybody's just trying to copy the switch and like put, put like, you know, strike lightning in a bottle again. I just, I don't think it's going to happen, man. Like the switch is the switch for a reason, you know? uh nintendo is unique in that regard they can pull something like that off i just don't think any of these other ones like and even one for valve it's like i mean what what's like special about it there aren't going to be exclusives on it you know it's like it's not like a console in the way the others are you know they're 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 just going to have whatever games are on steam are going to be on this thing probably um to a degree so i don't know we'll see and also, price is also a factor here, depending on how powerful they try to make this thing. Like, I mean, if this thing costs anything more than 300 bucks, you know, I think it's a dud, in my opinion. Like, I, I just think it's going to flop. So, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. So, yeah, we'll see. Uh, but we do have more rumors about the Switch. And uh, Bloomberg is reporting that Nintendo 
will reportedly be releasing a new Switch Pro as early as September, uh, and it's going to be it's going to be using a uh, faster NVIDIA chip uh, for graphics. Um, it's going to, which will enable 4K resolution when docked to a television, and it is going to be a seven inch screen. Um, it's going to te- more than likely cost more than the current Switch model, though the three hundred dollar Switch. Uh, so this one, Montreal, does this one excite you? Uh, it doesn't excite. Okay, it does excite me, mm-hmm. but uh, it doesn't excite me. Now, yeah. if this was two years ago, if the if the situation from two years was today, mm-hmm. all for it. Yes, pre ordering, you know it. Now, I don't feel like I'm going to get it. <laughs> I might be in the same boat, dude. I don't play my Switch that much. I just have to like come to grips with that, you know. I, I just well, it's, I don't, it's I don't, not I don't, that I don't play it that much. It's not that I don't play it that much. I want to get this because if it improves like everything, I'm all for it. But the thing is, bots. I, we are. I just the oh, yeah. the resellers are going to yeah. pounce on this thing and destroy mm-hmm. it, and we're not going to get it. It's going to be another Xbox One X Series X, another PS5 situation, and for Nintendo to be actually releasing it, I mean they just. Don't give a fuck. I mean, we already know they don't give a fuck, but mm-hmm. like they really don't give a fuck. <laughs> so that's my, you know, my take on it. I, I just I'm I want to be excited for it, but I can't be excited for it because mm-hmm. there's no way we're gonna get it. Like, there's no way an average person is gonna get it. We're gonna have to be like how we were with the PS5. We're gonna have to be right there. We're gonna have mm-hmm. to as soon as it's announced, we're going to be like, oh going to like three or four different sites trying to look for it. And I just, I don't have the energy to do that again. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. I just did it with the Xbox, dude. It's still happening. Like you still can't find these fucking things. So, um, I get it. I get what you're saying from that perspective. Also, I will say though, in, in Nintendo's favor in this regard is the report says that this is going to replace the $300 model. So it's going to become the new base switch model. Um, which means they're going to put their full manufacturing might behind it. Um, so there could be more availability than, you know, we would anticipate with something like this. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't like, this isn't like a new switch in the sense that like, this isn't the switch too, but this is as close to that as you can get without calling it that, you know, I think. So this sounds like it's going to be a pretty significant revision and, uh, the Nvidia chip too, I want to bring up. Um, the one that's in the switch currently is actually really old. Like it's several years old, like probably 2014, 2015 in terms of when it was like actually contemporary, um, a, a contemporary chip. So what they're working with now, I mean, could end up being fucking light years ahead of that um, with this new switch. So this thing could, could have more battery power, like could have, could have better battery life, uh, especially with older games um, and also way more power that it's going to be, like uh pushing out in terms of graphics with the 4k and whatnot so uh, so yeah that's uh i don't know it's exciting it's just i think the thing for me is like i don't know how much i care because like i just said i don't i don't play my switch that much man i like when i look back every year at my switch usage i play maybe four games a year you know on it and um it, it really is like a very specific machine that i play very specific games on with it um, I'm just not playing it as much as you would. I would, I would think I would, but you know, so I don't know. We'll see when it's announced. I may change my tune. If this thing is just going to like fucking blow my goddamn minds, you know, but I just don't believe it at this point. So <clears throat> we'll yeah. see. Uh, I mean, maybe it's supposedly... 4k. That's about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, also they said it, it, there's a good possibility it's going to be revealed before E3. So if it, I mean, we're going to hear about that in a week or two, if that's the case. So yeah, I um, keep thinking E3 is like years away, but it's actually like, yeah, you're right. Like a month, like a couple weeks away, not even two weeks. It's uh the 13th. It starts on, I think it's like the 10th is when like pre E3 stuff starts. That's two weeks from right now from recording. So, so yeah, we're not we're not far out, dude. Um, and there, there's there's other events that are happening beforehand too. So, um, what this is gonna be, we're gonna have a lot of news in the next few weeks. Basically, what I'm saying. So, we'll see. We'll uh we'll keep you guys abreast if Nintendo announces a new Switch. We will be all over that. So, 
All right, let's move on, Montreal. Um, so the company Dreamhaven, we talked about them uh, several months ago when they first were announced, uh, when the company was first formed. This is the publisher that was formed by Mike Morham, the former president of Blizzard uh, for, for decades. Um, and uh, he formed this studio with a couple arms off of it, um, which were Moonshot Games and Secret Door. Uh, and the reason we're bringing that up is because they just announced a partnership with Frost Giant Studios, who is a RTS-focused studio full of former Blizzard developers who made StarCraft, WarCraft 3, StarCraft 2. Um, and they've also formed partnerships with three other studios, Light Forge Games, uh, OMG, One More Game, and then Raid Base, all studios that also have former Blizzard developers in them. So it's feeling like here Mike Morham is forming his like new new Blizzard Neo Blizzard uh, over here at Dreamhaven and uh, Montreal. I I will not lie to you. I'm actually kind of excited. Uh, hold your horses because we don't even know what the projects are. We don't know anything. Uh-huh. I, know. I learned my lesson uh, just from a couple games. I can't even name the games, but I I, I just learned my lesson not to get too hyped. So. I'm uh, very interested in see what they're going to make. I want to ma- make some kind of announcement first before I get super hyped. But that is a really good lineup. Like, it is mm-hmm. a super good lineup. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, well, like, when they do reboots and stuff like that, or they do spiritual mm-hmm. successors, like, if they do a spiritual successor of StarCraft, it's still not mm-hmm. StarCraft, you know? So I know. I know. I know. I learned my lesson with this with Ukulele, right? Which was yeah, uh, yeah. Platonic. <laughs> The former Rare developers all formed a studio and were like, we're making a banjo game, and it, and it ended up being shit. So, <laughs> um, you know, like it had none of the charm and like personality that Banjo-Kazooie had. And uh, so I, I have learned my lesson with this. I, I think I'm just I'm tentatively excited because I think even if they don't start off strong, which I think is a very high possibility, most of these studios won't start off very strong. Um I think in well, let's say five or ten years, they will have the freedom though to figure out where they want to be and what they are, you know, as studios and what kind of games they want to make. So that's kind of what's exciting to me is I think I think at least there will be a vision for kind of where I wish Blizzard was heading had 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 like had gone to after Warcraft three and World of Warcraft, you know, yeah. uh, before the Activision merger. I I, I think that's kind of my hope, but you know, that is a high expectation. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but this is very newsworthy though, in my opinion, because this is like silently all of a sudden dream has got all these studio partnerships that they're going on. And they're basically like turning into a publisher, um, you know, and, and, and this isn't like, I mean, they're not at like the level of EA, obviously in Activision, they're not even close to that, but um, it'll be interesting to see what kind of other moves they make though, because, they're not going to be able to just live off of former Blizzard developers probably forever, you know. Yeah. So we'll kind of see. We'll kind of we will see uh, where they end up, kind of what their plan is, you know. If they do become a powerhouse within video games, that would be very interesting. Also, Frost Giant in particular, I have keen interest in because they really want to make an RTS game that can work in the modern day, and I'm just very interested what that looks like, you know um because that genre is just like non-existent for the most part you know now yeah so yeah so yeah it'll uh it's exciting man it's exciting i, I just want to be excited about something Montreal. let me be excited let hey, me be excited I'm just, about I'm just saying, I'm just saying. you gotta we gotta tone it down i know i know you're right you're right you're right okay let's get to the meat the meat of the episode Montreal. sony today had a live stream showcasing Horizon Forbidden West. And it was about 14 minutes long. Um, we did not get a release date or even a release window, but they're still saying 2021. So I'm assuming if we're going to find out. What? I thought I said 2022 at the end of the no, video. It didn't say that. No, it didn't say anything at the end of the video. There was no date range or even year or anything. So. They said in the blog post, um, we don't have an exact release date yet, but development is on track and we'll have an update for you very soon. So very soon to me, 
I would assume is the next couple months like that, that uh, anything later than that. And uh, that, that will probably would be 2022. So, so yeah, we'll see on that, but the uh, gameplay Montreal 14 minutes. I believe you watched it, right? Yeah, I did. I watched it live. Okay. So uh, what'd you think of it? Um, it was horizon, but one thing that I was looking at was the combat, mm-hmm. uh, particularly the close quarter combat. And it looks like they fixed what I was having issues with. Mm-hmm. Um, the main things I have an issue with, which was the close quarters combat, which was almost pretty much non-existent. And it looks like they have amped that. And I'm wondering if you can like, you know, unlock a little bit more combos. I know it's not going to be Devil May Cry, but like, can we unlock a little mm-hmm. bit more combos or get more powers as relatively to her, um, to her spear and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. That's the main thing I was looking at. Um, I was always impressed by her bow and arrow skills. Um, I actually like that she has more traversal skills, which leads me to believe that there's going to be more a focus on uh, like dungeons and stuff like that. It's uh, just this open world map where you have to hunt monsters, uh, mm-hmm. which I'm really looking forward to actually, because they wouldn't just put that in there if, if that was the case, if that makes any sense. Because uh, it looks like you're going to be in this world, you're going to be in more dense forest types areas. So maybe it is going to be open world, but it's going to be more in a dense forest, like where you're fucking jumping through trees and abandoned mm-hmm. ruins and stuff like that. Instead of just a, a vast open field like you were in, uh, in the first mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, so on the melee combat because I think that was one of the things that you and I have really harped on that we didn't like about the first game. Um, I I'm not sold on it. It definitely looks more precise than the original game. The original game was really like weird and floaty and like not even I don't even want to say floaty. Just like it was kind of like it just felt like there it was wasn't- an afterthought. Yeah, it felt like it was just kind of thrown in. It wasn't like it really didn't have much to it, you know. Um, and this feels like there were actually a little bit of combos. The animations look way more pres- like slick, and and the actual targeting feels really precise. Like she's yeah. she's hitting um, the way she's hitting her target feels way more like engaging, you know. Because in the first game, she was just kind of swinging. It was like a it wide was, arc swing. Yeah. yeah, it was really a wide arc swing, and it just didn't have good impact, you know. When that like. Like you like the the feedback you got from hitting something with your melee weapon in the first game just didn't feel good. And just watching this, I can tell that's totally different now. Um, what I will say though is that I'm not sold on it because all we saw was like a couple combos, and then we saw her use like some power move where she slammed her thing down and did this like electric attack or whatever. That's about all we saw. And I just I need to see more of it before I really feel like that's fixed per se. Mm-hmm. Like it's like actually asset to the game you know yeah um so but i will say the rest of it the game looks fucking gorgeous like absolutely stunning this game is going to fucking blow our minds i think when it comes out like graphically yeah um just the amount of foliage and particle effects and shit going on is absolutely insane and people were saying this on twitter but i don't know how the fuck they're gonna get this to run on a ps4 like a base ps4 dude like the fuck like it, it just it looks that good, you know, um, in terms of aesthetic and, and just how much is going on on the screen at any given time. But um, so that's a good thing, though, because that means that they didn't necessarily hinder development to have it on PlayStation 4. So um, it, it's it's really exciting to kind of see what these games are capable on, on PS5 and the, the new generation. So um, so, yeah, the game looks gorgeous uh, in terms of traversal, too. It's really cool. All the new stuff they added. There's like a you know, like a little bit of a grappling hook now, it looks like. Um, and she's just very mobile in general, Aloy. And um, I like that element of it. I think it really is going to allow us to take encounters in a different way. Whereas the first game, like you said, was a lot of open fields and it was really fucking boring to fight things because once you were seen, you couldn't get away in any real way. Like it was just like, you're just in, in a field. So it was like, go hide in the tall grass if you get away for a second. And that's like, that's the only way you can really get away, you know? Whereas yeah. in this game, it's like they give you like the smoke bomb thing that uh, lets you kind of like go stealth for a second, um, which was, I-, I thought was a really cool thing. And also there was a little bit of monster hunter in here as well. When the, mo- the, uh, the, the yeah, you roared, saw that, right? <laughs> she staggered. Yeah. She staggered for a second. I was like, I was like, 
they've been taking more from Monster Hunter. So, um, so I think that's good though. I think this st- this game really should like this series really should lean into that kind of design. Uh, to be honest, I think this is I think that's where Horizon shines. It's not at the level of like you were talking about, like that Devil May Cry kind of action style. It doesn't it doesn't shine there. I think the encounters you they need to play them. And design them so you're more thoughtful in the way you approach them, you know? Well, yeah, that's what the director said he was going to, they were trying to go for it, um, to be honest. And I honestly believe him, mm-hmm. uh, which is funny because I, I think we were on two sides. Of it. I think the combat, like, looks really fucking good. Uh, yeah. What they showed, I think that that close quarter combat looks really good. Um, it actually gave me uh, Breath of the Wild vibes, but like in a good way. Like this is what I wanted mm-hmm. Breath of the Wild to be, as far as like mm-hmm. how fluid the combat was and how thoughtful it looks like. It, and it looks like it's super thoughtful as far as that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, this game is going to be just. I think the I think the game is going to be phenomenal. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but yeah, I, I think uh, it's just going to be phenomenal. And then yeah, it running on the PS4. Oh shit. Uh, it running on the PS4 is uh, really great. So I think that's the thing. Uh, you can take over from me for a while real quick. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I think the, I think as a, I think as the, after Ratchet and Clank, this is going to be kind of the next big tent pole in the fall. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not really sure that this game is actually going to come out in 2021. I really think 2022, early 2022 feels pretty likely uh, at this point. Like I, I'm thinking February, which is around the same time the first game came out, um, is is much more much more likely than than 2021 at this point. But they haven't proven us wrong at that with that yet. Um, but it's just the fact that they didn't give a date on this is really conspicuous given we're only six months away from November, you know, like we're not that far away from the fall season of uh, games and we've got no indication of the actual release window at this point. So I'm, I don't know. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a bit of a question question for me there um, in terms of the release release window. Um, one thing, a couple things I did notice though, is um there were no damage numbers during the combat um it was a very conspicuous thing that wasn't there because the first game built itself as an action rpg and this game i'm not sure is building itself that way um the lack of damage numbers kind of is interesting because there was no enemy health bars either which the first game did Mm, have that somewhat yeah um it had both of those things and those being gone, I actually think is a good thing because horizon as an RPG is not really an RPG. It's just a game with damage numbers where they're just showing you the damage. Like that's my opinion of it. And to be frank, like I think the game should kind of go away from that design. Cause I just don't think the game was very strong there and there's not, unless you're really going to lean into that like hard, there's no reason to even have that in the game, like focus on other things. That's kind of where I'm at. And that I'm, I'm, that's what it seems like they may have done here. So. Yeah. Cause God of war didn't have, it had action bars, but it didn't have any damage numbers per se when you're hitting somebody. Right. I can't No, Yeah. You had health bars, which is funny though. Cause God of war is much more of an RPG. I feel like than horizon was, uh, but yeah, it doesn't have damage numbers. It just has health bars, but your character has statistics Whereas in Horizon, your character really doesn't have statistics. You know, it's funny actually. The difference. Yeah, it looks in, like they just leaned into there. the action, and I'm all for mm-hmm. that. To be honest with you, just be an action right. adventure game instead of saying we're an action RPG game. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because you're yeah. right. I'm watching it now, and they don't have any damage numbers. And I thought maybe it's because they turn off the HUD for like um, presentation purposes, but no, the, the HUD is actually on too. So. You can see yeah, right. the arrows go away and everything of that nature. So yeah, I, I mean, I think yeah. it looks cool. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think uh, I don't know. I'm excited for it, man. I think uh, I don't know. I think at first when I first watched it, I was kind of not feeling it. I'm like, man, I don't know. Something about Horizon is just not really doing it for me. And that, that's still there for me. But um, I, I will say, talking through it with you right now, I'm I'm getting a little bit more excited about it because I think Gorilla is focusing on the like it seems like they focused on the right things with this sequel, um, and uh, that's 
that's exciting. Um, one more thing I want to mention too is uh, the story of this game is I don't know where they're really going with it, uh, to be honest, because after the first game, you remember the first game, the way it ended, right? No, you can tell me. Uh, oh, did you never beat it? Uh, no, I never beat it, but I don't really care to go back to it, to be honest with okay. you. Okay. <laughs> well, spoil- spoilers for the for the first game. Um, you know, skip forward a few minutes if you don't want to hear them. <clears throat> um, the game doesn't end on a cliffhanger. Like, you beat the bad guy. The thing is, though, the bad guy doesn't die. Uh, he escapes, and they make it seem like he's going to have a very heavy influence in the future. So okay. I'm interested to see if he's there. But also... You know how I mentioned about the first game where Aloy learns about the fall of society um, like a thousand years ago and no one else really knows anything about it except for her? Yeah. Um, That element of the game, it kind of seems like she might have shared some stuff with uh, uh, the guy she was trying to save in this gameplay demo because he found the thing she was looking for and they started looking at it together and it was literally a map of the globe. Like it was the entire globe and it was showing them like spots of interest that they wanted to go to. Um, so kind of interesting that she may have brought some people in. Cause that guy's from the first game, the guy that was, she was trying to save. Okay. He's a important character in the first game actually. So, um, so I don't know. I'm interested there too, because I think the first game, the story in the first game was such that I just didn't know like where they could go with it necessarily, um, in the next game. But, but did they ever we'll explain see. why the robots are ro- the animals are robots or some of the animals. Are yes, robots. they did. Yeah. Yeah. That was whole, that was a whole part of the narrative in the first game. That's kind of my point is like, they explained all the interesting pieces already of the world, you know, is that those, those robots were like created by, um, they were specifically created. I think by the humans before the fall of society, I don't remember exactly why, like the specific purpose. I think they were like protectors though. They were supposed to be protectors and they ended up becoming, like violent at some point and got corrupted. Um, okay. So that was like the, that was part of the narrative of the first game. So, so yeah. Um, once we get a release date, we will let you guys know. Um, all right, Montreal, let's move on uh, to our next story. This is, uh, this was a leak. This next story was a leak from a Sony investor presentation uh, that they kind of let slip that Uncharted 4 may be the next game coming to PC of uh, Sony's exclusives. And that's an interesting choice, I would say. I mean, Macho, what do you think about that? Uh, Uncharted 4 is really old. So I think it's about four mm-hmm. years old, I believe. Three or no, four years old. No, it's actually six, it's six years old. Whoa, okay. It came out in 2015. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, honestly, that makes sense. I mean, you can't really lose any... You don't really lose any investment off of it if it does go to PC. Mm-hmm. If they mod it or pirate it or whatever the case that companies are scared of going to PC for, um, and it will probably bring more people into your ecosystem. So, mm-hmm. I think it's a good move, uh, or I think it's a safe move rather, and it doesn't really surprise me to be honest with you. Um, I thought it would be it would have been God of War to be honest with you, but uh, this is this is interesting. I wouldn't be surprised if they port all the other games, all the other Uncharted games to PC. Well, yeah, so that's the weird part, though, is that the other Uncharted games aren't on PC. So you're going to port the fourth game in a franchise to PC, to a platform that has no access to the other games? Like, that's weird to me. Because Uncharted 4, like, I think you would be very confused if you played it. Like, it it definitely has some tie-in to the other games. Um you know, there, there's benefit to have pl- having played the other ones. So I, I think that that's why I think it's an odd choice. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, I think it'll sell. I think it'll I think it'll do fine as long as the port's good, which Sony's been having trouble with that actually lately with their PC games. But I'm, I was actually wrong. It came out in 2016. So it is five years old. I think um, I think it came out in May of 2016. So um, so it's it's old, but it's not like super crazy old. Um by our standards i guess um but that's cool i'm glad they're continuing to bring pc more games to pc uh from their library um you know i think some people seem to think god of war is coming next and i just i don't know why but part of me for some reason i don't see that i think that's not i I, I just don't like i i feel like that one's like still not 
ready to be on PC. Like I, I feel like it's just not the place to go. That's not the place I would go next, I guess. It's kind of what I'm saying. So, but uh, we'll see. There's no actual announcement yet, but I'm sure they'll announce it soon. We'll probably get a release date with that. Uh, all right, let's move on to April MPD numbers for the video game industry. Um, this was an interesting. This was an interesting one for MPD because we've been tracking this obviously since the podcast started and uh, last year was the beginning of COVID. And remember there was an explosion that happened when COVID started where the industry kind of boomed big time and, and number and uh, sales numbers just kind of skyrocketed. Um, well this April compared to last April, very interesting numbers. So total video game sales, April, 2020 was 4.7 to 1 billion versus this year 4.645 billion which is yes a minus two percent decrease in total sales number for the entire industry uh compared to last year so we're gonna this is gonna be interesting as we go forward kind of what these numbers start looking like um which is it's kind of crazy given the fact that we have new consoles i think that the thing about this is there's just not a lot of games to play on these new consoles right now so, um, yes, we have new hardware, but there aren't games driving sales right now. So w- it'll be interesting to see as the months go on, like Ratchet and Clank comes out in a few couple weeks, how that impacts it. And, you know, we get more games on Xbox and PlayStation 5. Uh, but continuing here, uh, video game content. Last year, April 2020, uh, this is phys- physical, digital, full game sales, microtransactions, subscriptions, the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, four point eight zero eight two billion last year versus four point one eight two billion this year. That is a two percent increase. Uh, video game hardware four hundred twenty million last year versus two hundred ninety six million this year minus thirty percent change. And then video game accessories two hundred nineteen million this year versus one hundred sixty eight million this year a minus twenty three percent change. Um. Montreal, I mean, how do those numbers strike you? Because the hardware in particular is interesting. The supply constraints of these consoles is really having a big <clears throat> fucking impact in sales. Uh, yeah, that, <laughs> I think that explains it all. Well, the supply constraints and uh, for me, I don't know if the software is going down, but for me, I would assume mm-hmm. like a lot of people aren't buying these consoles either. Um, because of resellers and things of that nature. So, I mean, they're barely making it because the resellers do, do contribute to these numbers. Um, mm-hmm. But I'll be hard pressed to see what the actual numbers they are in actual consumer hands. Like how many people actually have this, the percentage of people who actually have these consoles that compared to sales. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, venture beat, which is the site that reports these numbers. Um, they did make a good point here that April, 2020, um, was actually a really big year, a big month. That was the the month final fantasy seven remake came out and animal crossing new horizons, uh, had come out Mm. that as well. So, uh, this year it was like, you know, MLB, the show 21 new Pokemon snap near replicant returnal, which no offense, those, none of those games are even close to specifically animal crossing in terms of potential sales numbers and even final fantasy seven remake is bigger than most of those, except for probably the show I would say. Um, so like the, that, you know, that, that is something to take into account, but software is the only, the only area where there was actually growth. So the hardware part of it, I mean, I think it's pretty clear, like the supply constraints are having an issue with that, ha- having an issue there. So, um, all right, let's go to the top 20 best selling games for the month. Um, Number one, MLB The Show 21 uh, was number one. Number two, Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. Number three, New Pokemon Snap. Number four, Outriders hanging uh, hanging in the top five. Uh, number five, Near Replicant. Number six, Mortal Kombat 11. Number seven, Monster Hunter Rise. Uh, number eight, Returnal. Number nine, It Takes Two. <laughs> number 10, Mario Kart 8. <laughs> number 11, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, the 2019 game. Uh, number 12, Marvel's Spider-Man, Miles Morales. Uh, number 13, Super Mario 3D World. Number 14, Minecraft. Number 15, Animal Crossing New Horizons, uh, a year later. 
Uh, number 16, Super Mario 3D All-Stars. Number 17, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Number 18, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Number 19, Pokemon Sword and Shield. And then number 20 is Breath of the Wild. Anything jumping out to there? Uh, jumping out to you there, Montreal? Uh, Nope. Not for me. <clears throat> now, is this for... Well, oh, this is for... Okay, um, of April. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. Yes, April. Yep, last month. Uh, I guess but, uh, maybe Monster Hunter Rise been up there, or and Mortal Kombat 11, but Mortal Kombat 11 is always up there. That's I, I just think that's crazy though that it it's number six for the month, and Outriders even. To be honest, that's really impressive, dude. Like that that yeah, came out actually, in you know, March. You're right? Yeah, that's uh, that came out in March. Building. It was rank three in March and only dropped to rank four in uh, April. So actually, I'm surprised by Near Replicant, even though it's just this month. I really want to see how it's going to do next month. I really want to see if it's yeah. going to hang up there. Mm-hmm. That'll be interesting as well. And uh, one I want to call out though that I find super fucking weird is Super Mario 3D All Stars, which was taken off of the market on March 31st. <laughs> Do you think they kind of those numbers towards April? That could have been like. The- I'm not sure. That is a good question. I don't know how the actual uh, day, like, I don't know if they start at the first of the month and end on the last day of the month as their like number collection, or if there's some weird kind of uh, tracking that happens where it's like, you know, it's maybe it's like the 30th of the month before or something. Um, I don't know about that, but if not, like, if it is the first to the final day, like that. Uh, is bonkers because that would probably just be hardware sales or I mean, uh, physical sales, which is what they say here. There is an asterisk saying digital sales not included, but there were no digital sales because Microsoft, or sorry, Nintendo took it off the market. Like they took it off of eShop. You literally can't buy it. And, uh, so it's pretty crazy that they were still just selling through stock that they had out at retailers and they still charted this high with that, with that fucking game. Like, it's just, I don't know. I find that bonkers. Uh, <coughs> Even Call of Duty Modern Warfare being 11th, uh, like it's a game that's like a year and a half old, you know? Um, yeah, people it, don't, people don't, people just don't play games, man. <laughs> they do, uh, yeah, but they play the same, they play the same shit. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Returnal at eight. Um, I have a feeling this one's going to fall off their list entirely with May, uh, probably, which, you know, we'll find out in a few weeks, obviously if that's true or not, but uh, uh, even a game that came out late in the month, like Returnal did to only be eighth uh, means that it, it is not probably not selling super well uh, for Sony. So um, I doubt we'll get another one of these, but Housemark should be fine. Um, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good place for a studio of their size. So um, it's interesting. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, top 10 selling games of the year so far. Let's read these out. Uh, Number one, Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. Number two, Super Mario 3D World. Number three, MLB The Show 21. Number four, Monster Hunter Rise. Number five, Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales. Outriders is number six. Number seven, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Number eight, Mario Kart 8. Number nine, Minecraft. Number 10, Animal Crossing New Horizons. Most of this list is games that did not come out this year. So, you know, uh, take that as you will actually i think only three games no four games on this list came out this year so that tells you that that you know goes to show you there really is not that much coming out right now um there hasn't been this whole year uh that that's the situation we're in with this you know the top 10 best-selling games of the year list so all right macho anything uh anything else jumping out to you there uh the 10 top games for the year monster hunter rise Mm -hmm. that game just came out yeah, and I mean, MLB The Show, too, actually. Yeah, and it's already charting for the year, so that's pretty mm-hmm. interesting to me. We'll see if it hangs on, though. Uh, Monster Hunter World has had severe staying power for Capcom over the years since it came out. I'm actually going to be very curious if Rise is similar uh, because it's only on Switch, so I, I don't know if that's going to be the case. Um, I'll, I'm actually going to personally track that probably through these lists throughout the year. Okay. Because I want to see how that I want to see how that does the difference between the two, you know, the platforms. Because uh, I, I Rise, or, sorry, World, just it's the best selling game Capcom's ever had, and I think it just crested like seventeen million or eighteen million total sales Damn, since really? it came out Holy three shit. years ago. Yeah, man, no, that's what I'm saying. It's fucking nuts. So I don't I don't think Rise will come close to approaching that, but um, it'll be interesting to see how long it lasts on this top ten list for the year, uh, given some of the other releases that are coming out. So. 
All right, let's move on. We've got one more story here. Uh, Nintendo announced, uh, this was yesterday they announced this, uh, two release dates for a couple of Pokemon games. Pokemon Legends Arceus, which is the open world Pokemon game that they announced a few months ago. It is going to be coming on January 28th, uh, 2022. And then Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Pokemon Shining Pearl, which are the remakes of the Diamond and Pearl games that came out in 2006. They're coming on November 19th, 2021. Uh, Montreal, are you excited about either of these? Yes, uh, the Pokemon open world game, Ar- Arturus or... Arceus? Arceus. Ar- 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 <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to say it. I, I think I'm saying it wrong too. Arceus? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm excited for that one. Um, I'm not really. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to buy Shining Diamond and Brilliant Pearl or whatever the fuck it's called. I actually <laughs> do not like though that version of Pokemon. Oh man, yeah. Uh, com- I think you're crazy. Yeah, I know a lot of people are like you're crazy. Either I don't know which one was it. Which generation was it where they had the ice cream as a Pokemon? I know that was totally. That was Gen off. Five. That was the generation okay. after this one. Okay. No, Gen Four, in my opinion, is good, dude. Gen Four is the one with uh, Chimchar. Piplup and uh, Torterra, which are, or sorry, Tortwig. So Tortwig's the grass uh, turtle. Piplup yeah, is the yep. water based uh, penguin Pokemon. And then, and then Chimchar the is the ape. fire, uh, yeah, fire ape. Um, and yeah, so I, I think this generation is actually really good. There are a lot of really cool Pokemon from this generation, uh, like Lucario and uh, fucking Garchomp. Oh, yeah, shit. you're right. You're right. Okay. Um, I, I so, might buy it. I, I did like the way the remake looks. Uh, it looks mm-hmm. like, you know, a chibi version. I, it didn't mm-hmm. go with the actual X and Y remake version. It did like a chibi version of it, of like what yes. the Game Boy games look like or whatever, but they're mm-hmm. being 3D. So I might buy it just to see that because, I mean, that, mm-hmm. that looks really cool. I think uh, if they ever do a diamond and or a black and white remake, because that's Gen Five, right? Yes. I yeah, I might not buy that because I I'll I didn't be skipping that. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I I actually was not too fond of that generation. I did like black and white too a lot, um, but when black and white came out, I was just like, "What the fuck is this?" Like, mm-hmm. they had that generation had the weakest Pokemon, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the uh, Pokemon Legends game, I'm excited about it. I'm probably going to buy it. But the thing about it is, is like, I don't, I really need to see more gameplay of it. I think that's the thing I'm I'm going to, if we don't get any more like trailers of it before it comes out, I'm going to wait till it comes out and really like watch gameplay of it because I still think there's a lot of questions about that game, you know, like in terms of what is actually like how the game plays, you know? Yeah. So. Like I, I agree with you. That's what I was really surprised that it's coming out in January. I expect that shit to get pushed back. I, yeah. I just I can't see that happening. Like the the trailer they showed us looked like it was not even pre. I was like a pre alpha build that wasn't even alpha stage. Uh, mm-hmm. The trailer they showed us. So mm-hmm. right. I don't know unless they've just been working their asses off i mean i know they're going through uh, japan's going through another covid situation right now unless they have a really good streamlined work from home system i i would i expect a delay i don't think that's coming out until like june of next year or uh what's another physical year uh fiscal time maybe march that's usually a good fiscal time for like nintendo Mm -hmm. so i think that Mm -hmm. that may be the more realistic approach yeah yeah, and I, I, yeah, I, I think that's the thing with the that game is I, I really would say temper your expectations, everybody. Like, don't get too crazy hyped about this because I just based on what we saw, it just does not look like a game that's like a hundred percent ready for prime time. You know, so I don't know. We'll see, but, um, but that date's not like you said. It's I mean, it's pretty soon. I, I would be. I'm kind of in agreement with you. I wouldn't be surprised if it gets delayed as well. So cool. Uh, Anything else you want to talk about with uh, Pokemon? No, I'm done with Pokemon. (laughs) (laughs) Even though we're both going to play it probably. Yeah. Um, All right. Let's move on to our final segment of the day. News is done. Listener questions. Um, Like I said at the beginning, that dude holding it down again. He sent us a couple questions. Uh, So let us start with the first one. 
What announcements are you hoping to see at E3 this year? Uh, Montreal, would you like to go first or do you want me to go first? Uh, you can go first. Okay. Yeah, I'll start. Uh, so I'll start with Square Enix. Uh, we did just talk about this, but I want that new Team Ninja Final Fantasy game to be real. <laughs> and I want a trailer for it, um, like a gameplay trailer for it as well, like actually having uh, gameplay in the trailer. Um, so I definitely am hoping for that. Also, I want more information about Final Fantasy 16 from them. Um, I'm very, very, very tentatively excited about Final Fantasy 16. I really like what I saw of it so far, like in the first trailer. Um, so I'm really hoping to see more of that and maybe even a release window potentially um, next year at some point. Um, and then uh, Monolith Soft uh, for Nintendo, I want to know what they're working on. It's, I mean, we're at the point now that I think it's been three and a half years since Xenoblade Chronicles 2 came out. And um, obviously we had Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition last year, but that was a remake of an existing game. You know, I don't I don't think their their main team was working on that. So I'm actually really thinking we may see something from Monolith Soft um, uh, when Nintendo does whatever their, their presentation ends, ends up being. And also, uh, I didn't write this in the doc, but Intelligent Systems, I want to see that uh, Path of Radiance, Radiant Dawn uh, re-release, remaster that I predicted at the beginning of the year i really want to see that as well um and then uh also the xbox bethesda conference that has been announced for june 13th i think uh i like i'm just super curious like we need to see xbox studios games get announced shown more in depth and actually start getting some release dates on them besides halo um we really need to start seeing some of these games and and seeing what xbox has in store um for their stuff so uh, Montreal, what about you? What uh, what announcements are you <laughs> hoping for? Uh, so there was a Sonic stream day, uh, which was... Mm. I don't know. I think uh, I had the same level of disappointment that I had with the Zelda stream that they did, or that Nintendo did. Mm. <clears throat> oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, this was the 30th anniversary of Sonic, and it was just uh, really... I'm using this time to lament about that. Uh, it was really, I was really disappointed and I really did get my hype up because I mean, Sega released this like cool fucking commercial for the, you know, the stream and everything. And it was like a really good, cool, nostalgic commercial. Uh, I thought it was really cool, uh, showing how Sonic has been with you through the, through the years as gaming and stuff like that. And they show people playing the first Sonic and it's so like a little kid and all this shit. And they were just been hyping it up for the last week. So I was really excited for it. Um, all we got from it was Sonic Colors, which is probably the best in the boost modern area. I call it Sonic. Uh, probably the best Sonic game that you can probably remaster. Um, they, they call it Sonic Colors Origin or Ultimate. So they're probably going to be adding content to it and stuff like that. Um, but we got none of the Sonic Advance games. Oh, and we also got a a, a collection from... Uh, a remaster collection for Sonic 1, 2, and 3 and CD. Uh, those are going to become the consoles. Mm. Okay. Uh, which is cool because those aren't available on consoles. I think 1 and 2 are available, but 3 isn't, I think. I'm not sure. Um, but, yeah, that's cool um, that they're remastered and it's going to be you know widescreen and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> and they did say they were adding content to those as well, so I'm very interested in seeing what content they add to those games. Um mm. Uh, but we didn't get any of the Sonic Advance games that were on the Game Boy Advance, which objectively are probably the best 2D Sonic games they ever made. Uh, none of the Sonic DS games, um, which, which was a bummer. Uh, they did have some like additional bonus content of Sonic content for other games. And uh, they <laughs> announced a, a chain for Sonic and everything of that nature. Like You can get like an actual diamond chain that's coming out. <laughs> Of Sonic, uh, Shadow, uh-huh. Knuckles, and Tails. Oh, man. Yeah. And they said, they said, for their hip hop community enthusiasts, and I'm like, you know what you mean by that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. But, um, yeah, then they announced a Sonic game at the end. They showed Sonic running, and that was it. And we have mm-hmm. no idea what the Sonic game is. Uh, mm-hmm. So I say all that to say, I hope. For the love of fucking God, 
Sonic Team gets off their fucking ass. Just give me, just give me Adventures Three, just please. I know Sonic the Hedgehog 06 was supposed to be Adventures Three, but that game was a fucking disaster, and we can forgive y'all for that. Just give us Sonic yeah. Adventures Three. Give us a child garden, man. That's all we want. <laughs> it's all. I think yeah, that's the all. Child, yes, the child. Yeah, man. Just I think I that's what everybody wants. Every I don't care if you're like an old school boost, an old school retro fan, or you know you want the boost mechanic fan or whatever. I think everybody unanimously agrees. Everybody wants adventure. Just give us adventures. Dude. Or heroes. Deep, yeah. How deep was the child mechanic in Sonic Adventure 2? Like it was like, super what deep. The, it was insane how deep it was. <laughs> like it was a it was an entire video game, I feel like, within that game, dude. Like and I as a kid, I remember I poured fucking <laughs> hours into those goddamn things. Like, <laughs> dude, I was I was like super into that shit for some reason and i I don't know why because there was all these like mini games you could play with them and stuff like you because you would like grow them and evolve them and they would level they literally would level up and like evolve from what i remember right you're right you're right um and then and then there were like these mini games where they would like they could fight each other or they would race against each other or some shit and like it was just dude it was like fucking weird though it's so weird though to like think about it in retrospect like I don't know, but hey, I'm with you, man. Like, yeah, fuck it. Like, bring back the little chow guys. Like, let's go, man. Let's let's have some fun. Um, uh, the so- little Sonic Pokemon mechanic, you know. <laughs> so I did put Switch Pro in here, but um, I'm hoping for some kind of Star Fox game for. Mm-hmm. I'm just hoping. Um, um, I know that's you like turn a- me. You turn my mood sour. Yeah, no, they're not. If we get one, you know they're gonna fuck it up, bro. <laughs> Like you know, they're gonna fuck it up. How cynic? That's how cynical I am at this point. Nintendo doesn't know how to make a Star Fox game. Or I was I'm hoping we can that. get some kind of a uh, like, hey, maybe we release virtual, well, not a virtual console, but we release the, the the Game Boy Advance games on the Switch now. You know, on the, on the eShop because I would buy those fucking mm-hmm. games. Um, so I'm hoping for that. Uh, my next uh, bullet point is Fable. I did have Xbox games, which you already had that in there for your Xbox announcements. So I would just one particular game from Xbox is Fable. I'm hoping that mm-hmm. I know they teased it, um, but I'm hoping mm-hmm. that we get some kind of gameplay or something. I know it's being made in the for the Forza engine and everything of that nature. Um, but yeah, I just want something of that. And I'm actually looking forward to some Capcom announcements because I know they're going to be at A3. Um, as well uh so i'm looking forward to that and because they have a lot of interesting ips and i'm I'm interested in seeing what they're going to try to revive or bring back there has been rumors i remember that rumor uh that huge rumor mail that we had mm-hmm. where they said no all their games got leaked so i'm hoping they oh, push yeah. some of those up because i'm really hoping for that power stone i know power stone was like 2024 i was hoping like that's like a uh a- <laughs> A, yeah, yeah, like a, a gimme, like it was like, oh, we're gonna fake you out with that, and we're actually gonna release it now or whatever. So I'm really hoping for that, or uh, maybe see some more of that Resident Evil Four remake. We haven't seen any of it, mm-hmm. and I really want to see what directions they're gonna take that game because that is a very important game to a lot of Resident Evil fans. Uh, yes. and that remake can actually make or break that game because it sounds like they're trying to remake it. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that like kind of needs to stay, which is one of the things I, I mentioned before is the campiness. So mm-hmm. that's it for me. Yeah. I forgot about that, that leak uh, of all their shit for like the next, like several years when uh, ETH, <clears throat> when they're con- whenever they do announcements, we, we need to like go through that list, I think, and like, see, see how right it was. Yeah, know? exactly. Um, Cause I'm assuming it's going to be pretty spot on, but it'll be interesting to see how spot on, is, uh, how spot on it was. So, so yeah, um, yeah, I'm I'm excited, man. Like we didn't really have an E3 last year, and um, I think the industry as a, as, a, as a whole was like, you know, oh, we don't need E3. And I think, I think we all learned over the course of this past year that we kind of do need E3 in some way. <laughs> yeah. Because um, to me, it just I don't like all these fucking streams. All these companies were doing were just shit. Like they they sucked, and they they announcements were bad. Uh, the streams themselves were bad. They were poorly produced. They were poorly paced. Like they just, they just weren't good. Um, so I'm, I'm excited that we're kind of getting back to the old, old, at least the maybe somewhat of the old way of, of uh, doing the announcements at E3. So, uh, okay. Second question uh, that we got, what are 
three comfort games you guys like to play. Um, and I guess I'll go first uh, here. So uh, here's my magic three is my go-to. That's like the easiest one for me. Um, I, it, it does not matter how old I get, how long it's been since I last played here is my magic three. I can literally boot this game up and play it. Like I was just playing it yesterday. Like I will not, I remember all the mechanics of this game. I remember almost every fucking creature in this game, all the artifacts, all the town types. I remember the creatures abilities, like special abilities and which creatures are good against which other. Like I know all that shit. Like, like I've fucking been playing it. You know, I've never stopped playing it. Like that's how ingrained in me here is my magic three is. Um, and, and yeah, so I mean, that is like my number one absolute go-to comfort game. Um, the next one is, uh, actually Grim Dawn. This game really has become a comfort game for me where I will just go months and even a year plus sometimes without playing it and then just randomly pick it up for like three weeks or four weeks at a time, you know? Um, that actually happened to me in December this past year, you know, and I just like picked it up for a while, played it for a bit, put it back down and I'm probably going to pick it up at some point in the next few months. You know, it's just, a, it's a, it's a, it's kind of my modern game that I really go to when I'm like in a bad place and I really need something that I can just play. That's fun that I don't have to think about a lot. Um, you know, that's kind of that game for me. Uh, and the last one is uh, just the civilization series as a whole, um, particularly right now, Civ six, but you know, Civ four, Civ five over the years also were in, in this space uh, for me. Uh, this is also a series that is just like, you know, I really enjoy it. It's a very calm game for the most part. Like it's a turn-based game. Um, and it's just something you can play without like, it's not a very stressful game, even though it is mentally demanding and mentally draining at times. Um, it's just like the, the game is chill. You know, it's a very chill game to play, especially the early game is very fun. I love the early game of civilization. So, um, so yeah, those are my three games. Montreal, what are your three comfort games? Uh, League of Legends, but not ranked. I just play like stupid. Okay, I was gonna yeah, say. I just man. play stupid stuff like, like uh, Abram and uh, okay, uh, mm. maybe Norms or Blind Pick, and just try different stuff out and everything like that. Because everyone's super chill in those, usually for ninety percent mm. of the time. <clears throat> um, and I just play with my friends. Sometimes I don't play ranked. I just play with my friends. We we really like Aram, so we've just been playing Aram and spamming that. Um, yeah. Uh, Devil May Cry Five. I like to go into the Bloody Palace and see how far I can get, and that's about it. Like that's, mm. I love to do that because I love that game. I love the, all the super combos that you can do, and I'm still discovering the combos and everything like that, and how to break the game as far as like you know canceling animations and stuff like that. Uh, and mm. then my last one is Sonic Adventure Two. I always play uh, just Sonic's. And Shadows <laughs> Adventures or their stages, I have the whole game unlocked and finished. Uh, but I always just play their stages because I don't know something about their stages that just like maybe I'll play one knuckle stage uh, because the music is so good. Um, mm -hmm. But it's always like Sonic stage and the, the stages I always play. I always play White Jungle uh, mm -hmm. or Green Jungle, uh, Radical Highway, uh, the, the City Escape, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. I usually skip past the uh, the space levels for both of them because they're kind of they kind of the pacing in those levels are kind of weird. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, like I I love playing Sonic Adventure too. Just just randomly playing that's like my, one of my comfort games. Yeah, I know what you mean. I I need this game to be modernized and like re released, you know, uh, because I I actually agree with you. Like because I remember as a kid, this kind of was a comfort game for me while you know GameCube was still contemporary. Um, is that I would just turn it on and play. Uh, I think it's City Escape, isn't that Sonic's like first level? Yeah, yeah. Where you're on like the snowboard at the beginning of it yep. and uh, rolling down like the the streets or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That level, I played that level like fucking crazy. And then the other levels I really like to play were Sonic and Shadows uh, battles against each other. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why, but I really fucking enjoyed those fights for some reason because um, they're they're just. It's like a really unique thing that I think only Sonic can really pull off where like you're in this like kind of like almost like a high speed chase against each other, but you're fighting each other at the same time. Yeah. You know, yep, like you're trying yep. you're literally trying to like knock the other guy down, you know? So um, it's at those that level in particular is like really unique in video games to me because I just don't think there's a lot of franchises that like have that 
like couldn't really pull that kind of thing off. Yeah. And uh, that game actually pulled it off well, uh, in my opinion. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that too. I really did, did enjoy that game. That game was always um, comforting to play. <laughs> it's just fun, you know? So cool. Um, well, thank you for the questions, that dude. We appreciate it. Uh, like we do uh, every week at this point. <laughs> uh, but for the rest of you, Please send in questions. We'd love to answer them. Uh, Montreal, uh, before we go, is there anything else you would like to discuss uh, before we go for the for the week? Uh, no, I thought I did have something to discuss, but I don't. Okay, well, if you remember, bring it up next week. All right. Write it down somewhere. Um, okay, so this is going to be it for this week, guys. If you like the show, please like the show, review the show, and subscribe to the show on whatever feed you are listening to it on. And please, please share it with your friends. Uh, we are still trying to grow the audience. Uh, if you'd like to interact with us on Twitter, you can do so at I trap for the Hokage for Montreal. That is the number four, not the word. I am at Thunder at zero one, and the show is at the Players Take. If you'd like to send us questions, you can do so on Twitter, or you can send us an email to Players Take zero one at gmail dot com. And if you do send us a question on Twitter, please send it to the at the Players Take handle. That is how we track those. Um, that is the best place for us to track them, that or the email address. Don't send it to us individually. There's a good chance they may get lost uh, in those places. So, um, all right. That's it, guys. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.